For me, it's a great honor to introduce Father Jim Connor, who was the superior that I entered Christ in the Desert under when I first came to Christ in the Desert. And I can assure you that I'm not a genius, <laughs> and I was very difficult to live with. I don't want to make public apologies for Father Jim tonight, but I realized after I became superior, had he received the same support from superiors I had later, he would probably still be superior Christ in the desert. And because a young community is difficult to govern, and difficult to guide, and difficult to lead. And when young monks come and are constantly challenging and doubting and haven't worked out their own authority problems, and that's where I was, it's very difficult for a superior to lead the community. I did not make Father James' life easy for him. On the other hand, had he not been there, and I can say this honestly again as a thank you to Father Jim, our community would not be there today. There were just, there were no monks. And he was somebody who was there and who was willing to lead our community. He came from Gethsemane. He had a wonderful background with his own relationship with Thomas Merton. He had creative ideas. He was able to be flexible and to change as the community needed to change. And I would say, yes, there were conflicts. They're my fault with him. And I don't want to dwell on that, but I would like to dwell on the fact that he was able to lead us and to hold us together. I became superior then, and it could not have been easy for him. And yet his own life of prayer, his own faithfulness to his own monastic life have kept him a monk all of these years. And with his recent appointment as the superior of Ava, temporary, so it says, but one never knows what that means in monastic life. Uh, it's again, I think, a recognition of the monastic ordo and of his own superiors that he has tremendous and rich gifts to lead a monastic community. And I can promise him here that our community will be praying for him and praying for the community of Ava. He comes tonight to speak about Thomas Merton. He knew him personally. And I can see all the years that I knew Father Jim in the community there, he was always reading and trying to understand Thomas Merton more deeply. He's gifted, I think, as a writer, gifted in his ability to synthesize ideas from many different cultures, different backgrounds, and to bring them together and present them. So I think it's a special joy and a gift for the Thomas Merton Society, and for me in particular, to be here tonight to listen to him. And so I would simply turn it over to him now with a great thanks from the Monastery of Christ in the Desert and a personal thanks on my own part. <laughs> I'm extremely grateful to Father Philip for that introduction for his very extremely gracious words. He was not nearly as difficult to live with as he may have portrayed. And he was also certainly in his own right a very great blessing to the monastery because as he said at the time when I came as superior particularly, there was basically only three monks there. And so it was a very great benefit when they were able to get another authentic, solemn, professed Benedictine monk to come to Christ in the desert, uh, which has served them as the obvious seeds of its prospering growth these past years since that time. It's a uh, special joy, though, to be here in Santa Fe with you this evening. New Mexico has always been a very special place in my heart from the years that I was out here. Um, it was very coincidental in, this fact, in a sense, the fact of coming out here originally, because when Thomas Burton came through to visit in 1968, before he went on his Asian trip, he came actually twice during that year, once in May and another time in August. 
And when he came back to the monastery of Gethsemane, after his first trip, he was very enthusiastic about Christ in the desert. And he remarked to me at the time, he said, oh, he says, if you ever go any place, that that is the place to go. And of course, at that time, given the rigidity of our structures in monastic life, particularly in our travels monastic life, it was like saying, if you ever get to the moon, it would be nice to <laughs> bring a rock back. But uh, strangely or providentially or whatever it may be, within the four years after his death, between 1968 and 1972, the structures had changed enough within our order that it was no longer unheard of for a Trappist monk to go and live in a Benedictine monastery or in another place. And so when Father Gregory Borgstock, who was prior at that time, rode around first to the Benedictine houses and then finally, after getting no response from them, riding to the Trappist houses for pleading for help and for any personnel who would be willing to come, that uh, my abbot asked me at that time whether I would be interested in coming out to Christ in the Desert. And I can certainly say that my years at Christ in the Desert were in many respects some of the happiest years that I can remember. But I love Christ in the Desert very much and continue to love it very much. Um, and certainly I'm delighted at its prospering growth over the years and at its hopes for the future. The theme that I was going to discuss this evening, as I told Peggy, was that of um, Thomas Burton's thought about contemplation in relation to people in living in the world. So I'm not going to be trying to give you a specifically monastic routine uh, talk or synthesis of monastic life. It will be drawing on some of the writings and some of the thought of Thomas Burton in relation to what contemplation is. Merton himself was certainly a contemplative. He was a very contemplative person. At the same time as anyone who knew him, or even if you have read him to any extent, will know, he was a very complex person. So that he could be also a very active person, a very jovial person, a very um, at times even a little bit idiotic person. <laughs> so that he shared in all of the variety of elements which all of us inevitably experience, whether we are within the monastery or not. His very temperament and his upbringing, however, gave him something of that background to prepare him for being a contemplative. Both of his parents, as you may know if you've read his life, were artists, and both of them, in their own way, were probably contemplatives. His mother was an artist in her own right, and um, a very obviously a very introverted person and a very withdrawn person. Merton speaks of the Seven Story Mountain of her inability to show love warmth and motherliness and that's why i found that image of the motherless calf as being very appropriate for merton that uh, he was in many respects a motherless person and was constantly seeking and yearning for something or someone to be able to fill that void and that gap but in the very background of his mother and also that of his father, who was likewise a painter, an artist, and also something of a strong introvert, and something of a contemplative in his own right, prepared Merton to be able to experience this in his very being. So that it was not simply a mark of grace, the fact that he was a contemplative, or that he was prepared for the monastic life, that it was in part a fruit of his own natural upbringing. In one sense, however, this stems or illuminates something of what I consider to be the basis or the foundation of our own contemplative life. 
the very fact that we as human beings have been created as contemplatives. Adam and Eve were the first contemplatives. They were the ones who were able to walk in the garden with God. They were the ones who were able to have that familiarity with God, to recognize his presence in their midst. They were the ones who were able to look upon all the animals of the earth, to give them names, which as we know from the biblical background, means something more than just putting a tag on another thing. To give another thing or person a name means that you see and you penetrate deeply into the very essence and the very being of that thing or that person. And so Adam and Eve were our first contemplatives. And of course, when we read then those very early pages of Genesis, we get the first insight of how we are to live as contemplatives in that fact of being called to listen to the word of God, to hear and to heed that word of God as it comes to us, and to respond to it not only in God himself, but in one another and in creation as well. Even the later chapters of Genesis, where you get into the slaying of the murder between Cain and Abel. I always forget which one killed who, but you know, <laughs> the fratricide that took place at that time. Um, the sin that was involved in that was not merely a sin of murder. It was a sin also of refusing to recognize the goodness and the variety of the other person. And that intensity with which they refused to recognize the goodness, the beauty, the validity, and the quality of the other person was what ultimately led to the fratricide. And as we'll see as we get a little further along, we find the same identical phenomenon going on even today, not merely in fratricide in the sense of blood brothers killing one another, but of brothers and sisters telling one another throughout the world and even in our own cities. And the way in which that stems ultimately from the failure to live out our vocation as contemplatives. So we begin then with that basis that we have been created as contemplatives. We have been created not only in the image and likeness of God, but we have been created to view the world and one another as God himself views these things and these people. The fall then led Adam and Eve to deflect their view, vision, from this inner core of who and what each person and each thing is. They began to view each person and each thing simply in the value that it had for them and the usefulness that it had. And to that extent, they turned away from that original creation as a contemplative and as a child of God. But the root of that still remains within us. And the fact of being subject to original sin, while it does make it more difficult for us to live as contemplatives and to live as children of God, yet in no way does it make it impossible? In no way does it change that basic call. Merton speaks about this in one of his writings where he says that the seeds of this sublime life of God are planted in every Christian, we can say in every person, at baptism. But seeds must grow and develop before you reap the harvest. There are thousands of Christians walking about the face of the earth, bearing in their bodies the infinite God, of whom they know practically nothing. They are themselves children of God and are not aware of their identity. Instead of seeking to know themselves and their true dignity, 
they struggle miserably to impersonate the alienated characters whose greatness rests on violence, craftiness, lust, and greed. God does not manifest himself to these souls because they do not seek him with any real desire. But desire is the most important thing in the contemplative life. Without desire, we will never receive the great gifts of God. So what we are desiring to be, though, is not something other than what we are. We are desiring to be who and what we really are, fundamentally. And that entails, then, that willingness to let go of what we are not, of what we imagine ourselves to be, of surrendering that which Merton spoke of so frequently in his writings as being the false self, the, uh, sometimes being comparable to what psychological terms refer as the ego, this determination, in a sense, to grasp the reins of power for ourselves, whether it be our own personal power, whether it be the, person, the, the power in relation to others, or the power within the world at large, so that we can see something of that falsity that is in our hearts as well. And in order to come into the contemplative life, it entails having to face that falsity, which is a part of our heart and a part of our life, of recognizing the ways in which we are untrue to ourselves, the way in which we do rely upon so many other things other than solely upon God himself. And to the extent that we do this, then again, we betray that very nature of what we are as children of God. And to that extent, we also betray something of the very message of what we all claim to be the heart and the cornerstone of Christianity, namely that message of the Incarnation. All too often, we simply see the Incarnation as something, as a doctrine of truth, a doctrine of the faith, which relates to the fact of Jesus Christ as being both God and man. And we never carry it further than that. It becomes just a dogmatic formula. And maybe we can read more into that, maybe we can study more into that, to learn more about that. But it still remains something more that we stash away within our head, rather than that we see in the light of our own lives and our relationship with one another. What Merton emphasized repeatedly in his writings is the same thing that the fathers of the church, and especially the early Greek fathers, emphasized repeatedly, that God became flesh, became human, in order that humans might become divine. St. Leo the Great is the one who expresses that in that particular maxim. And so the meaning of the incarnation then means that we are divine as well as being human. And that our connection with God is not something which is extraneous to our own selves and our own lives, <clears throat> our own being. It is recognizing that as a living doctrine within our life. So the incarnation then is something which is very pivotal to the contemplative life. That Jesus tells us in the Gospels that he has come in order that we may have that life which he himself is. That I am the way and the truth and the life. Whoever believes in me has that share in that life. And so that is what the contemplative life is to be, is to open our eyes to recognize who and what we are. To open our eyes to that relationship that we do have with one another and with all creation. So, Merton reminds us that for this very reason, we have to be cautious about how we approach even this fundamental desire for contemplation that he says is so basic. And he speaks about this in one of his writings in his typical sort of humorous way. He says, if, if such an eye one day hears about a contemplation, he will perhaps set himself to become a contemplative. That is, he will wish to admire in himself something called contemplation. And in order to see it, 
He will reflect on his alienated self. He will make contemplative faces at himself like a child in front of a mirror. He will cultivate the contemplative look that seems appropriate and that he likes to see in himself. And the fact that his busy narcissism is turned within and feeds upon itself in stillness and secret love will make him believe that this is contemplation. If we were able to see that as being contemplation, then we might think that it is sort of an easy way to self-satisfaction or to self-fulfillment. But so what Merton goes on to express in the course of his writings is that our movement into contemplation and into the contemplative life and into God is the very same process which Jesus Christ, in the mystery of his incarnation, lived out namely a process of dying and of rising, of dying to that old self, of dying to our ambitions, our own searchings and yearnings for power and prestige and all of these things, and rising to the new life, which is the life of God within us. And so each time that we find ourselves in this process of death and of rising, that is a critical time for ourselves, and it is a critical opportunity to grasp more completely, grasp is really the wrong term, but to enter in more fully into that vocation that we all have to be contemplatives. Um, there's a very fine quotation that I found from C.S. Lewis. <clears throat> who is certainly a contemplative himself. And he makes the remark, he says, my idea of God is not a divine idea. It has to be shattered time after time. God shatters it himself. He is the great iconoclast. Could we not almost say that this shattering is one of the marks of his presence? And most are offended by iconoclasm, but blessed are those who are not. So again, we tend to think all too often that crisis periods within our life are, if possible, to be avoided. That everything should ideally be able to go along very smoothly on this ever upward moving plateau. But just as you see in looking out your windows, you recognize that the hills and the mountains are not one simple going up and smoothly going over to the other side, but it's filled with all sorts of crags and, and uh, culverts and everything else that we all tend to have to go up and down and, and around and everything else. And that very process, as he says, of that shattering of our former idea of God, forces us to a new understanding and a new experience of who and what this God is in our life and consequently who and what we are in our own lives and in our relationship. So Merton saw these crises as being a very important part of his own growth in contemplation. And certainly, if you've read his life, you're aware of the fact that he had many crises within his life, right up to his dying days, that he experienced many changes in a variety of ways in which he himself was not simply on a constant upward plateau of moving into monastic life or into the Christian life or into holiness and sanctity. So, we are called upon then, as Merton expresses in one of his writings, following a Persian psychologist and mystic, that we are called to what he calls this final integration. And he defines this final integration as saying The one who has attained final integration is no longer limited by the culture in which he has grown up. He has embraced all of life. He passes beyond all these limiting forms, 
while retaining all that is best and most universal in them, finally giving birth to a fully comprehensive self. He accepts not only his own community, his own society, his own friends, his own culture, but all humanity. He does not remain bound to one limited set of values in such a way that he opposes them aggressively or defensively to others. He is fully Catholic in the best sense of that word. He has a unified vision and experience of the one truth shining out in its, all its various manifestations, some clearer than others, some more definite, some more certain than others. He does not set these partial views up in opposition to each other, but unifies them in a dialectic or an insight of complementarity. With this view of life, he is able to bring perspective, liberty, and spontaneity into the lives of others. The finally integrated person is a peacemaker. And that is why there is such a desperate need for our leaders to become such persons of insight. Now one can only stop and I'm almost aghast when you consider the fact that these words were written 30 years ago and how applicable they are to our present day world. In some senses, one might even say that they are almost even more applicable to our world of today than what they were in the world of 1965. Because we see this division that exists between nations, between ethnic groups, between tribes, between cultures, between religions, between ideologies. And even within religions themselves, we see more and more the phenomenon within the church of today, within our own country of today, of this rigid way in which ideas become concretized, and of the refusal to be open and to listen and to hear the ideas and the thoughts and the place where each other person is. It's the basis for what we see going on in Africa, in Bosnia, in all parts of the world, in Ireland. It's the problems that we see in the, the uh, rigid break or the rigid division between liberals and conservatives within the church and within the state of today. It's the basis for the um, <coughs> gridlock of Congress, and it's the basis of the refusal of people to really accept one another with love. So that ultimately the phenomenon that we experience today is seems in many respects to go diametrically opposite to this call to be contemplatives. And yet underlying that still remains this basic and fundamental call, which is the very root of our being and the very heart of our very human nature, that we are still called to be finally integrated in this way. We are called upon to be open and accepting. We are called upon, as Jesus summed it up repeatedly in the Gospels, to love one another as he has loved us. And that is what it means then to become a contemplative. So I think that it's something that we have to remind ourselves that contemplation cannot be identified simply with putting ourselves into a corner or out in the woods or even in a monastery in a very isolated position and situation. The contemplation is something that we need to cultivate, to practice, to inculcate within our own hearts, within our own lives, within our own families, within our own institutions. And we have to remind ourselves that as Merton said again repeatedly, that if you are waiting for someone to come along and hand you the contemplative life on a silver platter and say, now you are a contemplative, you are going to wait for a very long time. The contemplative life is not something that is given to us in that sense. It is given to us, but it is given to us by God. And it is for us to take, to receive, to accept, and to live 
by this gift. And that is where it becomes the pinch, because we find it easier to live by this false self, the false images and values that we establish for ourselves and for our world, than we do by the values of Christ. And so again, it's important that we establish times and opportunities and situations in our own lives where we can be able to cultivate this. It's very important to have at least a very brief time, even if it be only five or ten minutes each day, where we can pause and reflect and sort of re recollect ourselves. A few years ago when the uh, movement of transcendental meditation was becoming much more popular, many of the businesses of this world, of this country especially, latched on to that from a purely pragmatic way. That they learned and they realized that by encouraging their workers to take time to practice transcendental meditation, that they became more productive in their work. And so they were cultivating this and encouraging people to take some time, even during the work hours. What we are called upon, though, is to see that, as Jesus said, the children of this world are wiser than the children of light. That we are called upon to cultivate this, not from a pragmatic view, not in order to make ourselves more productive or more amenable or whatever it may be, but we are called upon to practice this in order to be more truly who and what we are and to recognize more truly who and what each other person and each other situation is. So it's important that we try to cultivate this in whatever opportunities we have. Many times people are encouraged to have some little spot in their own home which you can be able to establish and set apart for yourself as sort of a private niche of your own, where you might have something of a holy picture or a crucifix or an icon or a uh, retablo of some kind, just to serve as a reminder to draw your attention back to that centeredness, that corneredness, in which we have to face God and have to face ourselves. <laughs> It's good also to be able to cultivate the appreciation and the use of scripture in our own hearts and lives. Again, even if that be only reading a few brief verses each day, but the repetition of that is very important because just as the monks have found over the centuries that that daily repetition of the Psalms and of the scriptures becomes deeply imbued in our bones and our very being. So also, by allowing ourselves to hear these scriptures, we allow it to enter in and to touch our lives and to touch our hearts. And it's important not to limit our contact with the scripture as Christians simply to what we hear in the liturgy. This morning, being here in Santa Fe, I took the opportunity, as I have sometimes done when I'm in a city outside the monastery, of simply attending the Eucharist in the, uh, here at the cathedral this morning. And uh, it's always an interesting phenomenon, of course, to take part in a parish liturgy as the participant rather than as the celebrant or the officiant and the like. Because when you're there simply as a participant, you're totally at the mercy of what the <laughs> liturgy is. And while they had certainly a very nice liturgy this morning at the cathedral, it also struck me that if, if a Christian is depending upon what they are going to get out of that brief half hour or hour each week, then they are going to end up being very impoverished, uh, religiously speaking. That it's important to make frequent contact with the scriptures and to allow ourselves to enter into them in our hearts, in our being and not just to wait until the time that the liturgy itself comes along. Merton speaks then of a program of what he calls five different possibilities or points that we might look at very briefly 
as being something with elements which are particularly applicable to people within the world in your own situations who are searching for a contemplative life. And he says, first of all, that it might be possible by the sacrifice of seemingly good economic opportunities to move into the country or to a small town where you have more time to think. He grants the fact that this might involve the acceptance of a relative poverty, but he says, if so, all the better for your interior life, because <laughs> you're taken out of the rat race that is so common and prevalent in our own society. The sacrifice could be a real liberation from the pitiless struggle which is the source of most of your worries. Secondly, he says, wherever you may be, it's always possible to give yourself the benefit of those parts of the day which are quiet because the rest of the world does not value them. One of these is the earlier morning hours. He says, even if a person cannot put a few hundred miles between himself and the city, if he can get up earlier in the morning, you will have the whole place to yourself and taste something of the peace of solitude. One thinks of the movements of centering prayer with the encouragement to spend 20 minutes in the more early morning, and again, if possible, in the evening, in centering oneself before the Lord in prayer, which is wordless and which enables one to hold on to the Lord by a simple word to bring our wandering minds back before the Lord. Merton encourages one to go to the early Mass, even though the later ones may be more splendid and solemn. At the earlier Mass, things are quieter, more sober, more somber, more austere. The poor go to the early Mass because they have to get to work earlier. And Christ is more truly with the poor. His spiritual presence among them makes their Mass the more contemplative one. And then he adds also that it should be obvious that Sunday is set apart by nature and by tradition of the church as a day of contemplation. And he emphasizes how we have tended to see the Sunday Sabbath from a pragmatic point of view, almost as if that you back off in order to gain a little more steam to do that last mile of the run in order to make more money the following week. This is the inevitable reactions against this stress, the legitimate but more or less insignificant recreations that make Sunday a day of rest for the body as well as for the spirit. Sunday is the day of the Lord, not in the sense that on one day of the week one must stop and think of him, but because it breaks into the ceaseless secular realm of time with a burst of light out of sacred eternity. Sunday is a contemplative day, not just because church law demands that every Catholic assist at Mass, but because everyone who celebrates this day spiritually and accepts it as face value opens their heart to the light of Christ, the light of the resurrection. In so doing, they grow in love, in faith, and are able to see a little more of the mystery of Christ. Then fourth, he says, no matter where one seeks the light of contemplation, one commits themselves by that very fact to a certain spiritual discipline. This is true not just, this is as true outside the cloister as in it. But he doesn't mean by the spirit of discipline taking severe hardships upon ourselves or severe fasting or scourgings or things like that that we have tended in the past years to have as our first image of what discipline or asceticism is. He says, to do this would be an illusion. Active virtue and good works play a large part in the contemplative life that is lived in the world. And for this reason, the discipline of the contemplative in the world is first of all, the discipline of fidelity to their duty of state to their obligations as a head of a family, a member of a profession, a citizen. 
Do we ever stop and reflect on whether we are fulfillment of our civil obligations as a citizen? For example, the simple duty to vote, whether that has any relation at all to our contemplative life or not. But it does have a bearing because of the fact that it is a part of our duties of, st of our state of life as Christians in the world. And our obligation to accept that and to cooperate with that and to carry our own burden of that and not simply sit back and complain about what someone else is doing or what someone else isn't doing. Perhaps indeed, he says, some of the difficulties of people in the world exact from them greater sacrifice than they would find in a cloister. In any case, their contemplative life will be deepened and elevated by the depth of their understanding of their duties. The sacrifices that parents have to make, the sacrifices that the teachers or instructors have to make, the sacrifices that business people have to make in order to be honest and integral in society of today. Those are extreme difficulties and extreme disciplines that we have to put upon ourselves and to have to be able to see that in the light of our own contemplative calling, the calling to live the life of God in this world. Then finally he says, it follows from this that for the married person, their married life itself is essentially bound up with their contemplation. It is by marriage that such ones are situated in the mystery of Christ. It is by their marriage that they bear witness to Christ's love for the world, and in their marriage that they experience both the trials and the joys of love. Their marriage is a sacramental center from which grace radiates out into every department of their lives. And consequently, it is their marriage that will enable their work, their leisure, their sacrifices, and even their distractions to become, in some degree, contemplative. Do we pause to reflect upon that in our efforts to strive for fidelity to marriage, of seeing that fidelity as something more than just avoiding adultery? as being true to one another and true to ourselves on this level that he's speaking of and recognizing that that is fulfilling this mystery of God's of Christ's love for the church as St. Paul expresses in Ephesians. He says it should above all be emphasized that for the married person, even and especially their sharing of married sexual love enters into their contemplation. And this, as a matter of fact, gives it a special character. The union of husband and wife in nuptial love is a sacred and symbolic act, the very nature of which signifies the mystery of the union of God as human in Christ. Now this mystery is the very heart and substance of contemplation. Hence, married love is a kind of material and symbolic expression of the human's desire for God and God's desire for the human. It is a blind, simple groping of expressing, a groping way of expressing our need to be utterly and completely one. So contemplation then is to bring us into that unity and all of the things that contribute to leading us into this unity or to expressing this unity, whether it be in the sphere simply of mutual love and respect, or whether it be in this very intimate and very sacred uh, area of nuptial sexual love. All of these are ways of embodying and carrying out and expressing that mystery of contemplation. So those are the, the main points that Merton touches on in his program that he gives us of a way of contemplation for people living in the world. There's much more, of course, that could be said about his writings on contemplation. Some have seen contemplation itself as being almost the pivotal thought of all of his writings. And it is that, particularly if we see that in the way that I've been trying to speak of it, of 
contemplation, and not just as the times that we close our eyes and withdraw into our own heart, but as contemplation as the ways in which we strive to live out and to embody that very nature of what we are as children of God, and that call to unity and wholeness and completeness that we can only find in and through our life together with God and together with one another. And so I'd encourage you certainly to try to practice some of these things in your own lives, in your own ways, to study Merton as well in the broader scope in which he speaks of these, and to, as Merton says, to cultivate that basic desire that we have to allow ourselves to value those times when we experience our inability and ineptitude and poverty of being able to practice and to carry out contemplative life. And to turn to the Lord with plea that he will grant to us what we lack of ourselves. There's an extremely beautiful prayer of uh, Tagore, the Indian poet, which I don't recall the whole thing, but it ends up as a prayer for this spirit of poverty in a sense. And he's asking God to grant him the ability to yield into God's hands all of these different powers that he has, all these different ideals that he has. And he finally ends up the very last line and says, and grant me the, the strength to render my strength into your hands with love. So if we can render our strength into God's hands with love, to accept our own poverty, and to allow God to fill us with his strength, with his love, with his contemplation, then we will truly be contemplatives, we will truly be children of God, and we will truly be uh, fostering that life which our world of today stands in such great need of. Thank you very much. Still, yes, very much so. Do, do you have any retreats up there for the public or individual? We, we don't give retreats. We invite people to simply come and pray and live the life with us. So, but it's, it's we always say, Brother Christopher always says, the canyon is your retreat. <laughs> very true. Most all of our monasteries really uh, have an, 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 not an organized program. There, most all of our monasteries do have guest houses and the retreat facilities in that way. St. Benedict's Hall Hospitality is being one of the, the uh, cornerstones of monastic life and seeing the hospitality in that light of allowing others to share in the life that we have and the opportunities that we have. So as the Lord said to the James and John, come and see. <laughs> Father? Yes. Uh, in reading Thomas Merton's uh, writings uh, for the last 20 years, uh, I often read who he references. And I'm just amazed at the amount of reading that Thomas Merton did. And I've really come to the conclusion that he would have had to have been a genius or he would have had to have had a hundred secretaries, because it's just that the reference material is phenomenal. Uh, what are your feelings on, on his, his, his intellect uh, personally? Was he a genius? Or how was he able to amass all this information, synthesize it, and then write about it? How did he do it? In many respects, I think that you would have to say that he was something of a genius. Um, you know, he, was, he was an extremely unique individual. And um, yet at the same time, I would not want to exaggerate that because he had certainly his own humanity, his own limitations in life. 
One of the traits and the qualities that he did have, though, which contributed to that genius, was the way in which he was able to utilize time. Uh, everyone who knew him and all of his biographers has spoken of the way in which he was so extremely sedulous in making use of any small moment of time that he had available. That if he was having to sit outside the abbot's office waiting for five or ten minutes to get in, that he had a book there, or he was making notes, or he was, you know, something in that way. Same way when he'd be going to town to the doctors or whatever, that he, uh, he utilized that time very well. He did, however, also utilize his friends outside the monastery who helped in sending him digests or synopsis of material which he was working on. Uh, this was true both in the spiritual material and also in the uh, contemporary material that he was working on, or the historical material that he was working on. He didn't have a whole slew of uh, secretaries, but the Patrick Hart, of course, has always spoken of as being his secretary, but the Patrick has always been primarily the abbot's secretary. And uh, he did a great deal of the intermediary work with Merton because of that. But uh, it was only the last year of Merton's life when he had already made plans for going to Asia that Brother Patrick was formally assigned as Merton's secretary. At this, he also made use, though, when he was novice master, of some of the novices to uh, have them to do some of the typing for him, uh, even some of the translation uh, for him, different things like that. But uh, you know, even that, even with all of that, though, it is amazing what he was able to do. Was he novice master when you were at Gethsemane? Mm -hmm. uh, while I was at Gethsemane, yes, he was not. not he was not my novice master. He was. Uh, he was my master of students when I became a student. And then in 1955, he was made novice master and held that position for 10 years. Did you help him so? I worked with him after I was ordained in 57. Yeah. I worked with him as undermaster of novices for three years. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so he, you know, he, he was always kept busy though. I mean, you know, as you know, not only the number of books. Actually, actually, he was criticized for being so busy because he assumed to be uh, not assuming with other people. Like exactly. That. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, well, in fact, in the, in the, even in the 50s, Father Elwood Graham, a Benedictine in this country, or he said actually from England, but he, he was in this country at that time, he wrote a rather severe critique of Burton in one of the Catholic periodicals, in which he said basically, like practically everybody else has said ever since then, that what Burton needed to do was to limit himself more, and in a sense to almost specialize more, and not spread himself too thin. Uh, Burton was rather sensitive about that at the time when Gilbert Graham wrote that, and they were able to patch that up after a period of time. But uh, at the end of his life, though, Burton himself came to admit the fact that he did tend to spread himself too thin. And it is mind-boggling when you see the, the number of subjects that he treats and the things that he wrote on and the variety of topics. But um, he was also just a very unique individual. And uh, I don't think most of us would be able to, even though I know how sedulous we use our time. <laughs> would you agree with me in saying that if he wasn't a monk, he would have probably been famous anyway? At least for his writing ability? Well, of course, he had already begun publishing his poetry before he entered the monastery. Uh, and he would, he tended to still to look upon himself primarily as a poet. And there's a number of commentators who have written on him who do still tend to look upon him as primarily a poet. Personally, I've never, uh, you know, seen him in that light. Partially, it's just the fact that I have a limited appreciation of poetry myself, or limited <laughs> exposure to poetry. And so nine-tenths of his poetry just goes over my head, especially his later poetry. But uh, you know, a number of his poems, particularly those which do relate to events or people there at the monastery, I can resonate with very much. Um, 
But I suspect that if he hadn't have been become a monk, that he would have been a philosopher of some kind anyhow. And whether he would have written specifically in the spiritual vein that he did or not, maybe he would not. He also painted very well. Uh, not a lot. But yeah, not a lot, and it depends on how you qualify very aware. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, uh, you know, his, his paintings have sold and everything, and uh, there are really more drawings and sketches than paintings. His father did paintings, but uh, Merton himself really didn't do any paintings as such, but there were the, the drawings. Um, they're a particular genre of drawing or of art. Um, whether even his artwork would have been as popular as it is had he not had the popularity that he did, or that he was not as well known as he did already, I would rather have my doubts. He was also an excellent photographer and a very contemplative photographer. He expressed his contemplation through his photography. Um, there again, whether he would have become a famous photographer or, or not, um, who knows. But he was multi-talented in that way. And uh, he found it very difficult to limit himself. And so, in a sense, he paid the price for it too, in the course of the, uh, you know, the inner struggle and the pain that he himself encountered and experienced in trying to work out the balance of these things. Well, if you can ask any more questions, I'll continue to ask. Go ahead, Mr. Francis. Since he had his time so well scheduled and he was organized, yes. did he have patience with people who were no, not as organized. And could he take time to sit and and listen to another person and advise or be a spiritual advisor? He was a tremendous spiritual advisor. He was. Um, in fact, I've always said that I've never encountered another spiritual director like him. And it's always been in sort of a uh, a vacuum in my own life, having experienced him spiritual direction in the early part of my life, because he was my spiritual director and confessor during those years when he was master of students from 51 to 55. And, you know, I certainly value that extremely, but I have never found anyone since that time who can, you know, either listen the way that he did or share the way that he did. At the same time, though, he had his side <laughs> as far as, you know, times and circumstances where he also could be rather intolerant and very quick with people, uh, especially if he felt somebody was, you know, either just trying to cultivate him for the sake of an image or was trying to play up to him in the sense of uh, appearing better themselves than they were. He could be very short with that. And I saw him a number of times, you know, really call people's bluff very quickly and very, very definitively. And, uh, and he had his own limit of patience, too, especially the last, in 67, when he was getting deluged. He had gone out to the Hermitage already, and he was still getting deluged with visits from people and letters, part of which he had instigated himself and part of which had come by there on the board. And, uh, you know, it, it created a real crisis for him there that last year. But he wasn't physically so well anymore, either. That's right. And you do get a little different when you first do it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Father, he fell into that category, didn't he, of a prophet is not known in his own country as far as the monastery was concerned? Yeah, and his relations with the community itself of Gethsemane was, again, a mixed bag. Uh, there's many people still today who look upon Burton as you know, certainly a very great monk and a great man and, uh, you know, someone who had a very profound and a great influence upon Gethsemane. There's some who still look upon him as just being a fake, <laughs> uh, as being someone who didn't really live what he professed or what he claimed or what he wrote. Um, and of course, that's become even more obvious in a sense as some of his personal writings have come out, or personal circumstances have come out in recent years through his biographers and possibly will be even more so in the coming years as his private personal journals 
get published, which are supposed to begin possibly next year. The fifth volume of his letters is due out at the end of this year, and then they are planning seven volumes of journals uh, of his own that will be coming out after that. So there's still a lot of yet to, to be learned about Merton. I'm just curious if his five-point program that you alluded to is early or later in his life. That was at almost the end of his life. Oh, really? Because desire, in the sense, since he was moving much towards Buddhism, and, uh, I would think would be more willingness and the pursuit of God mm -hmm. through emptiness rather than through seeking God. God will find you when you're empty. I think was that's more included. The, was more the, uh, I thought, the thrust of his life toward the end. I think that's included in what he means by desire, though. And basically, it's also included in the, the term itself, of desire, when you get into some of the monastic literature over the centuries. Because if you, if you look into clearing yourself for the infusion of God, right. desire is one of the obstacles. From our usual way of using desire, you know, right. the, the, the Zen Buddha say the root of all suffering is desire. Right. If we did not have desires, there would not be suffering. But again, Merton is using the term desire in a more specifically Christian term, analogy, uh, which includes both this self-despoilment and the seeking and searching. Sister Francis. Uh, I hadn't realized that Merton had used the term centering prayer with a word. And I was wondering if you think he would be pleased with the Centering Prayer movement coming out of Snowmass, with its pretty tight structure and so on? I think he would be very delighted at the fruits of it. Whether he would structure it exactly that way or not, I would have my doubts. But I'm sure that he would be very, very pleased to see the number of people who are practicing Centering Prayer. Um, the thing that I think that he would have been horrified at I have always cringed at was Father Basil Pennington's claiming as if the, the uh, practice and the exercise of centering prayer originates with Thomas Burton. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just not so. That's the only place in his writings that I have come across where he even uses that term of centering prayer. And again, that was at the very end of his life, where centering prayer had already become something of a phenomenon. So he was, uh, would be favorable towards anything that would lead people into prayer, into union with God, and into wholeness. But uh, he would be very reticent to take anything that, to himself or to try to organize that. offended by it. I think he would tend to see it in the same way that he saw Buddhism or Zen or other religions even, as being something which is valuable in itself and yet which we can see as Christians as being still incomplete, uh, not, you know, lacking something in that final wholeness. But he certainly would not discourage it, I'm sure of that. Uh, he would I'm sure, in fact, that he'd be even very, almost intolerant of some of the things that Mother Angelica, for example, has said about centering prayer or about uh, the New Age movement and things like that. That, uh, you know, again, I think he would see that, those kind of statements as leading to the same kind of fratricide that I was speaking of at the very beginning. The judgmentalism that's behind as if that I have the truth and you do not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the enemy of Christianity. It's the enemy of contemplative life. It's the enemy of wholeness. And anything that, we, that generates that within ourselves, we have to recognize and we have to try to let go of. Isn't that why it's so hard for fundamental you know, religion? At least for me it is. Mm -hmm. And I try not to be prejudiced, but I can't help it. Well, we all, as, as a result of original sin, we have
have that prejudice within ourselves. Sure. But that's again why you have to ask, as our Lord says, ask and you shall receive. God got better as I get older. Good. Um, a lot of very bright people write, a lot of very spiritual people write. Uh, but Merton seems to have touched a whole bunch of the people the way a lot of other people have it. Right. Witness all the groups all over the world, Merton groups, and every place. What do you think was so special about him that he touches? What hunger does he seem to touch? And so many people that gather here and gather all over to talk about Thomas Merton. Mm -hmm. what you, What's your gut feeling about what he offered somebody that's so hungry within this soul that, that they fuss this way about this man? The thing I've heard very frequently as being the characteristic that makes him most appealing in the universal sense in that way is the way in which he could be able to express something in his own words which resonates with what we all feel within our own hearts. So that over and over again, People are talking about what draws them to Merton or what keeps them in reading Merton Alliance. So this is something to the effect that it's almost as if he was saying what I have wanted to say and could not even express to myself. And I think there's something to that, you know, which is the skill of expression. What the skill of expression, the honesty of expression, the willingness to expose himself, the vulnerability with which he was willing to open himself. Uh, in ways, you know, vulnerability, and not just in spilling his guts about facts, about what his life was, but of, 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 of allowing people to get a glimpse, at least, of what that true self is. Perhaps even in a way that he himself could not get it. His journals were very private to him. And um, when you say that you think there will be more people against him after the journals are published, is that really fair to the memory of a man who's done so much to inspire? I think so. Because fundamentally, my own feeling is that those who may be either turned off or may question the validity of Merton's appeal uh, as his journals become more public are people who are missing the point, in a sense, in the first place of what Merton is trying to say. My own feeling is that there's nothing in Merton's life, and I don't claim to know everything about his life or everything that's in the journals. I haven't read the journals yet myself. Uh, but my own impression is that there's nothing in there that would you know, turn me off on Merton, that would make me feel that he was uh, deceitful or invalid or anything like that. It, to me, it only makes him more real and more human, someone with whom I can identify all the more. And again, the, I feel, my, my own feeling is that the people who will not do that are people who cannot accept their own human limitations yeah. in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Did he give permission for him to be published? Yes. But in that case, it's the right thing. Did he personally give permission? Yes, he had set up a uh, will and testament with the literary before his death. And he specifically said you know, that he wanted to allow him his journey. He didn't specify that his private journals could not be published for 25 years after his death out of respect and deference to some of the people who would still be living uh, up to that time. And you know, of course, some few may still be living that would be involved in the journal, but for the most part, and quite a number of them have gone to the Lord and we trust God to Merton <laughs> since that time. Mm -hmm. I think what's so beautiful is just to see the audit trail that he left through his writings of his humanness and his growth and his vulnerability. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, starting with Seven Story Mountain and coming on to his more mature years, he just it's all there. Yeah, because all this stuff that's been coming out in the recent years about the question of whether he fathered a child or not, England and you know, before he entered the monastery and like it. Basically, that was written in the original drafts of the Seven Story Mountain. And so he was willing to expose himself at that time. But the censors of the order were the ones who were squeamish about it. <coughs> the idea that uh, people were reading that a Trappist monk may have fathered a child before he entered the monastery. <coughs> Scandalous. 
And that was the spirit of that time, you know, mm -hmm. possibly given that spirit of the time at that period, it may have been the best thing to censor those things. But we're living in a whole different spirit of the times now. I have a question. I was told that every letter he wrote was copied. There's a copy of it. Because he wrote two letters to one of the seminarians who he gave to me in the 60s because he knew how interested I was in learning. And I had them in the bank. Hmm. And I will give them to the College of Santa Fe. Do you think they are copied, or do you think I should see that somebody gets them, a copy of them? Uh, I would suspect very much that they are copied, because he usually did do it in a carbon copy. They were typed, and then he did sign them. Yeah. So you think they were copied on the Vietnamese wall, by the way? I they were with on the Vietnamese wall. Uh, what would be good to do maybe would be to write to Bob Daggy sometime and let Ooh. Bob Daggy at the Merton Center in Louisville. Okay. Well, and maybe send him a copy. No, that might be I great. can Xerox it. Yeah, that'd be very good. Okay, thank you. Just to I make sure. Yeah. But I would uh, make him not to be in he translation. Didn't, he didn't, uh, there, there wasn't that much use yet at that time of Xerox machines and so, uh, but he did use the carbons of most of his things. He did type most of his things. And uh, of course, it's interesting too the fact that he typed in his own way. He never learned the <laughs> typical, the, you know, the professional typing method. That he did all these books and all this correspondence and everything else with uh, two fingers on each hand. <laughs> it was basically the big system. What's happening to vocations and uh, uh, and and is the Reformation that he talked about, you know, in the, in the, the hermitage and the freedom. Uh, is that involved now? I'm just out of, out of touch with the current. Most all of our monasteries are still getting vocations, certainly. Uh, certainly in much smaller degrees than what they used to. Back in the, uh, at the peak point of Gethsemane was around 1950, early 50s. And at that time, the monastery numbered 275 monks. Now they number about 60 monks. And at that time, when we numbered 175, 160 of those were novices, which means the first two-year men. And uh, we had 80 par novices and 80 brother novices in those days. Now we have three novices and two postulants for the whole community. <laughs> and that's pretty much, you know, sort of the the scale that's on in most places. Um, but it is, you know, monastic life is continuing, and the renewal of monastic life is still continuing. I don't think it's a fade off complete by any means. And none of us know yet what the future of religious life or the future of the church will be or what it will look like. But we just have to trust in the Lord and the Spirit who hopefully is leading us all. Better not keep you all too late. One night. Um, Thomas Merton was way ahead of his times in just so many, many things, and even the women's movement. He wrote about that, and um, I don't know if I've read anything. If he's written about the image of God, I know for many feminists it's very difficult to just hear God as being male. And I just wondered if you knew anything. I'm certain today that Thomas Merton would be more inclusive and, mm -hmm. and No, he didn't, uh, of course, at that time in the 60s, the whole issue of inclusive language had not come up at all. And that's one of the problems that some people have even in reading Merton today, is the fact that his language is very definitely uh, sexist language. And even some of the quotes that I use, it's all he, he, and man, and all this. Um, at the same time, though, as you said, he was much more sensitive to feminism and the feminist movement than even than what I was aware of myself. I was telling Sister Mary Frances that when the Springs of Contemplation, the little book that came out a couple of years ago, was edited by Sister Mary Luke Tobin, uh, there's a chapter in there on the spirit of feminism. And when I read that, it just I just found it mind-boggling to realize that Merton had said those sort of things 25 years ago. And he had not expressed them loudly. I had never personally heard him say it. But uh, it was obvious that he was very much aware of that. 
At the same time, as far as with the issue of inclusive language, I strongly suspect Noyne Merton that he would be very, very slow and have very grave reservations in the issue of applying inclusive language to the level of God. And of course, that's the major issue even within people who do accept inclusive language. A lot of people will accept it on the horizontal level, as they say, but not on the vertical level. And of course, there are some very real, even theological problems in trying to apply the inclusive language to God on the vertical level. They're not insoluble and they're not insurmountable. And quite again, how we will speak of God 20 years from now, only she knows.